The Kaibab Paiute tribe's um, historical um, connection to Bryce Canyon is family. This is Southern Paiute territory. You know, we had different bands in this area. Um, all directions around this um, canyon, you know, there were different uh, Southern Paiute bands that, you know, that aren't here today, but um, were here in the past and that um, their descendants still live on. The Paiutes are still here. Our people, they relied upon this land to provide for them and, you know, to keep them alive. And, and the earth gave them everything that they needed. And what our people would do was, you know, anytime they went out to gather anything, they made sure that they asked permission first, you know, speaking to the creator, speaking to the plants, asking permission to use, you know, a part of that plant. And if it was medicinal, they would ask that it would heal them when they used it. Paiutes did seasonally gathered, you know, different kinds of plants, you know, like in the fall is the time um, when you see the rabbit brush blooming. That's a, what we call an indicator plant. It's time then when you see that brush turn yellow to go and gather pine nuts. You know, when you hear the pine nut birds, you know, you go out there and uh, gather pine nuts in the fall. Right here we have the manzanita. Manzanita, that's um, a plant that has berries on it. You can eat those berries. And it was also used as a tobacco. There's um, a plant called dogbane that you can use and uh, you can make strings out of it. You can make nets out of it. You can make carrying bags out of it. Basically, Paiutes, everything that they did was tied together with those strings from all these fiber plants. We have the cliff rose, you know, which grows in the area. And you know, cliff rose was something that was very valuable because you can make clothes. You could make skirts out of it, breech cloth, you know, for the men. It, it's not itchy like the cedar bark. Cliff rose bark is much more softer and more gentle on your skin. Ponderosa pines, you know, you could use those for shelter to make, you know, a brush hut, um, use it for wood, for cooking, for keeping warm. Even the rocks were um, something that you could use. And also talking to rocks, asking permission to use them to grind um, dry plant foods, um, dried meat, you know. And the animals here were the, some of the resources that they used for food, for clothing, from the deer and the elk and the antelope. And even the rabbits, you know, those, those were things that they used for clothing, for bags, for wraps. Prairie dogs were used for food, and the hides were probably use, used too, and the bones were probably used for tools. Today, Paiute people view Bryce Canyon basically just as your normal visitor. You know, but we still consider it a part of our homelands, part of our uh, Aboriginal territories. This is still a part of our our country, you know, we still um, claim it. Bryce Canyon, I feel, is really the northernmost periphery of our clan migration traditions. There uh, is a place uh, that is referred to as Sikya, um, meaning the place of the yellow peaks or points and I'm assuming that that is the tradition associated and the place name associated with Bryce Canyon. This particular area has always been, been a part of indigenous people and more in the contemporary sense part of the uh, greater population of people that come and visit and I believe it's really incumbent on all of us to really appreciate these kind of treasures that are still available to the, to the public. The Hopi people uh, is, is still a living culture and it's a vibrant culture with a full ceremonial cycle throughout the year. So I feel that uh, when people visit here they should Think about the indigenous people that once inhabited the place and that there is still a real association and emotional tie to places such as Bryce by the Hopi people. This is, this is our heaven. This is the human people's heaven and we need to appreciate that.
the mountain sheep dance has been around a long time, many years before time. That's how far back it goes when all the animals used to talk. And the Paiutes at that time were along the Colorado River. They were on the distinctive starvation because they didn't have anything to eat. So the mountain sheep heard that and he said he would give his life for the Paiutes in order for them to sustain their life. He gave his life just like an offering in order for us to live. And that's why they respect him that way today. The mountain sheep, his name is Nach. Nach is mountain sheep. Well, the Paiute culture is very significant because it's one of their original long, long time dance. It's interesting, it's cultural for the Paiutes, and we try to teach that to the little kids so they could understand as they're getting older. Because the Paiutes has a lot of culture that they need to learn, so if it's good for somebody like, I'd say like me, because I'm the older person that tries to teach them what, what's going on in their life, what they're going to have to pass on. Because if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it, and then it's just going to die off. Survival was a big thing for our people. My grandmother used to tell me that when you go somewhere up in the mountains, you always feed the mountain. By that, I mean we, she, she would always, she taught us to throw food in the four direction so that our young kids don't get lost, we don't get lost, the mountain spirits don't take us, you know, that type of stuff. That's what we learned from her. And she had to where we would take her out to different areas on, on our traditional areas and we'd say, Grandma, what's this? We'd get a plant. She was blind. She's always been blind as long as I, you know, remember. And she would pick them up and I would pick them up and give it to her and she would smell it and tell us what it is. So she used to always cry because she couldn't get onto these parks like this and get the edible plants to where she survived on those plants. She goes, I wish I had this and this, because that was part of her diet for a good life. And so you always respect the trees, the ground. Each one of them has a spirit, the rocks. That's why it is very strong here, because of the rocks too, in the ground. The animals, you could tell this is a good area because you see animals there. And they live here and they're surviving. So we have to, you know, take that into consideration of their livelihood as well as ours because we're not the only ones that live here and walk this earth. There's a lot of uh, memories for those of us that have had um, grandparents that uh, told us stories about coming up here and um, hunting and uh, camping up here. Um, a lot of uh, People come up here and they see the, the beauty of the mountains, the formations of the rocks, and um, feel the spirituality of those areas. And it's felt today for, for those of us that pay attention to uh, those feelings. The rock formation is called Uru, the Paiutes called it Uru because they look like forms of people. And I was told that a long time ago, 
by my grandparents that at one time that it was people and they were frozen as made into stones and frozen. So we call it Uru. My people were very spiritual and they believed in um, the Mother Earth. They fed um, the Mother Earth and thanked her for everything that was here as well as in the valley because otherwise we wouldn't have you know food they wouldn't have any food to eat um, they wouldn't have the berries the pine pitch they used a lot and uh, there's other plants that they use not only for medicinal but to eat we were a strong tribe not not in warfare but in surviving This is my first uh, trip up to Bryce Canyon. And just driving up, I could see the, the beauty, the, the landscape, it's impressive. We've always known about areas like this here, but because of land restrictions that sometimes we were not able to come and reconnect back to our ancestors. So it's, it's a reconnection back to my great, 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 great grandfathers, grandmothers, my relatives come in here. When I first started this, it was uh, very emotional to come to places where I remember my grandfathers talking about. And now to be able to stand in the area that they were talking about is very moving, emotional, because it was only mentioned in the oral history, but now we're coming back and we're connecting all the dots to our homelands, making it whole again. Our people have been around this area and the connections, the involvement, the, the teachings, the learnings that we got from not only the, the Hopi, the Paiuse, but the other tribes that were here is what made us survive, is what made us stronger, made us to the Zuni tribe that we are now. I've been told by my family and my grand people that I call my grandparents and stuff, they're older people, that it's ha this place here was our our sacred grounds and where we fished and where we had our our, our ceremonial use and in, in the long run it really did belong to us once but now gone. Our traditional ways are kind of like waste in a way uh, because of the everything has changed through life you know because way back then we lived uh, just just a life, you know, to live, to survive. I've been here before. It really is a beautiful place. It was like bringing spiritual things to me, it, like a long time ago what happened and stuff. You feel, I visualized it and it's something really great, you know, give me a good feeling. A long time ago, our people came in this area to hunt, to gather whatever uh, vegetable, vegetation that they needed to get in certain areas that we didn't have up in our area, like the pine nuts. When I come into this area, it's like you belong, you feel that peace, you feel that quietness. You just feel like you're at home. We always say we're connected to our past. And so uh, that's the way I feel that there is something here that uh, our people used to, you know, have. And we never really ever let that go, even though we're living in a modern day world 
we still have a connection to our past. This is where our ancestors roamed at one time. But at the same time, we have to respect everything that's, that this area has. It's just not a place that is nothing. It has connections. We try to teach that to our children, telling them you're just not Native Indians for nothing. You're, you're Native for a purpose. I've been here once before. That's been like uh, maybe 45 years ago. At that time, when I first came here, the feeling I had was, uh, uh, it was kind of like a sacred feeling, you know. There was uh, sacred uh, feelings in the area around where I went, you know. I felt there was something there that, you know, I shouldn't go here, I shouldn't go there, I shouldn't do that. That kind of a feeling I had at that time. On today, I came back here today, I, that feeling is not here. And uh, it's uh, more like, uh, it was like a welcome feeling, you know. Because I was here once before, so maybe the area, maybe they, they knew I was here before, so they welcomed me back. I would like for the visitors that come here to Brass Canyon National Park to know that uh, the Indian tribe is a, was a roaming tribe. We are a very proud tribe. We have a lot of history, even though we've uh, lost a lot of our uh, traditional ways, but we're still here. The Navajo Nation has a vast area that they occupied before they were um, surrounded by a reservation uh, border. So some of the landscapes up in this area are in our oral history and our ceremony history. And we still go back and um, mention those places in our songs and our prayers. So even though Bryce Canyon is a couple hundred miles away from mainland Navajo Nation, they are still in our prayers and, our, and in our songs and our ceremonies that we do year round. The Navajo Nation oral histories and the stories of Bryce Canyon really goes back to the description of the landscape, the sandstone that you see when you come visit the park. Um, in oral history, this is a, a resting place for the wind people. And as you may have noticed, you know, the wind is all, all around us. And when the wind people travel, they gather sand from where they have been and redeposit it in Bryce Canyon. And that's how you get the different colors of layer. I think for the Navajo Nation, um, these lands were occupied by indigenous people. And a lot of these landscapes uh, we hold very sacred. You know, Visitors, no matter if they're coming from the United States or uh, across overseas, they need, to, they need to know that this is a place of reverence. These are sacred places, traditional cultural places that are in na national park boundaries now. So a lot of the places that we held very sacred, where we had songs come from, where we had prayers come from, uh, our national parks now. So, you know, when you come to visit, just be reverent and respect the place and always leave with the great landscape in your memory. The Navajo Nation calls Bryce Canyon Bistach Ipako, which is the sandstone and the vertical sandstone layers that are uh, visual. And it's a description of the landscape. Uh, a lot of the Native voices, our indigenous language, uh, describe landscapes, describes uh, how 
you know, a person looks and that's how we give names to these places. So, you know, these names are, weren't made, uh, you know, when Columbus landed. These names were made years and years ago. Um, and today we still speak the language. We still uh, reference these places in everyday life. We still have a connection to these places today. It's an ongoing connection that is will be never broken as long as we have our language. I'd like visitors that come to Bryce Canyon to know that Southern Paiutes are still here. Southern Paiutes visit this landscape not just through physical visitation, but through spiritual and ceremonial visitation as well, meaning we give offerings to the area of Bryce Canyon and the landscape that surrounds this area. We're not these people, these people once lived here, these people once thrived, these people survived in a harsh environment. Those types of statements to me are, are not true because it's who I am and I'm still here, we are still here. We as, as Southern Paiutes come here, we visit here, we recreate like every American citizen does. But to us, landscapes like Bryce Canyon mean more to us as families because Southern Paiute families lived in these areas. They lived around the seep springs, they lived around the, the uh, small rivers like the Paria. Southern Paiutes, as, as we call ourselves, is Nungwu, people of the land. Southern Paiutes are passing on tradition and culture to the youth through camps. The cultural camps teach the kids how to gather, how to know when and what type of seasons to pick certain plants, collect certain animals, other things. We teach them about tool making. We teach the kids certain games, like the Kwipak game or the Tadukwip. We also um, teach them how to respect the landscape and give offerings, how important offerings are to areas such as Bryce Canyon areas such as the Grand Canyon and different places like Zion and, and those places that you visit. Um, also, we stress that each environment has a spirit and that each spirit needs to be honored and recognized when you're visiting them or passing through areas like that. One of the other things that we teach the kids is respect for themselves as young native kids or Nungu kids. Southern Paiutes are continually coming back and we're no longer those people, we are the people who have lived here since time immemorial.